Welcome to the Big Bang. And in today's colourful show... I said in today's colourful show... Thank you. We'll be looking at colour and light. And I'll be showing you how to make a working model of one of the very first cameras. I've been looking at Big Bangs in a fireworks factory and we'll be setting off our very own Big Bang display. But first, a trick for you. Kate, you're good with light and colour, aren't you? Brilliant, brilliant. Right. Have a look at these two red squares, OK? Now, which one of these squares would you say is the darker? Is it the top one or the bottom one? Well, it's the bottom one, it's obvious. OK, well, let me just move it round for you, like that. Now, which is the darker, the top one or the bottom one? Well, it's the top one. You moved it up from the bottom. Hmm. All right, well, what happens if I take this top bit off? Watch what happens. Look, underneath, that's all one colour red. No darker, no lighter. And all this is is a grid that fits over. But look carefully at the grid and you'll see that the bars on the grid at the top are black and the bars on the bottom one are white. Now, all I did was move the position of those bars because the darker the bars, the darker it makes the red appear. It's an optical illusion, a trick of the light, if you like. It's not bad, though. It's not bad. You know, there are lots of tricks that show how weird colour is. I've mm -hmm. got one here. Now, if you look through a bottle that's full of water, everything looks turned upside down. Mm -hmm. but you I've look better that way. Thank you. I've got a card here that says carbon dioxide. The carbon's written in blue, dioxide written in red. And have a look at that through the water bottle. The carbon's gone upside down, but the stuff that's written in red has stayed the same. I told you some colours were weird. Well, keep watching and we'll reveal the secret of the red ink at the end of the show. <laughs> I'm rubbish at drawing, have you seen this? It's supposed to be a drawing of a, a rocket and a daffodil over the other side of the room, but I can't draw to save me life. Well, not freehand, anyway. But have a look at this. Here's a drawing which I did a little bit earlier on of the other side of the room. Now, you have to say, that is much better. But I had a little help from a rather clever machine called a camera obscura. Now, the camera obscura was one of the very first types of camera which has been around for hundreds of years and uh, come inside here and I'll show you how it works. You should be able to see a live image of the dining room there. Oh look, there's me. That's odd. Now the way a camera obscura works is very simple. It's this lens at the front which focuses the image, bounces it off a mirror in here onto this surface, this tracing paper, and you simply lay another piece of tracing paper over that one and draw, trace around the image that you see. And it will turn even someone who's hopeless at drawing into a reasonable artist. Now you can make yourself a camera obscura, but you'll need a camera obscura kit. And in your kit, you're going to need a magnifying glass, a mirrored bathroom tile, a washing up liquid bottle, a small box, and some tracing paper. Now then, you'll need to tape your magnifying glass onto the front of the washing up liquid bottle, about there, and cut the bottle till it's about this sort of length, and with that sort of angle on it. You'll see why it has that angle in a moment. And you're also going to trim this length, but I'll show you why you'll need to trim that length in a moment as well. Right, your box will need two holes in it. A round one at the front, 
and on the top, this square slot, and you push that bit down there like that, and that will give you the angle which you will mount your mirror in. In goes the mirror there to reflect the image up onto the tracing paper. Slide your lens mount, washing up bottle, into the front hole like this. Tape some tracing paper over the top of the box, over the slot like that. And then you'll need to experiment a little bit. You'll need to slide that lens mount up and down till you get the image sharp, till you get it in focus. And that's when you trim any extra length off your washing up liquid bottle. Then what you do is cover your head and the camera obscura, leaving the lens pointing out, of course. Put your tracing paper over the top and you're ready to draw. Gareth, 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 what are you doing? I'm taking pictures with my camera obscura. That, that, that's not a real camera. It can't, can't take proper pictures. Anything that takes a picture is a camera. In fact, I took this picture with me camera obscura. I refute you thus, as they say in science. And did you know that the very first photographic cameras were actually based on the camera obscura? Hmm, I can feel a Big Bang strange but true story coming on. Today's strange but true story is about a lazy French painter called Louis Jacquemont de Guerre. Now, Louis lived about 200 years ago and he earned a living from painting giant scenic backcloths for the Paris Opera. But it was very hard work and Louis was very lazy. I'm fed up of that. He had a good idea. He thought, wouldn't it be great if I didn't have to draw the things myself? But I had a machine which I could point, press a button, and out would pop a picture. Hey, that's not a bad likeness, that. You could see how that idea would appeal to Lazy Louis. Now, he'd already used the camera obscura, so he knew how you could use a magnifying lens to project an image. But how do you make that image stick? And he got out his chemistry set and started experimenting. He covered a glass plate with a chemical that's very sensitive to light called silver iodide and put that glass plate into his camera obscura. When he took the plate out, he had produced an image. But the trouble was, that image was very faint. A bit of a failure, really. So he took his glass plate and put it away in the cupboard. Now, a while later, de Gaulle returned to his experiment, reusing the same old glass plate. But when he reached for it and took it out of the cupboard, he realised something wonderful had happened. The previously faint image had become strong and dark and clear. Clearly, the silver iodide had reacted with one of the chemicals in the cupboard. But which one? He quickly checked all the substances he found in the cupboard. He exposed the plates to ethanol, to methanol, to cuprinol, to treacle. Treacle? Nothing seemed to work. But then Louis realised a glass thermometer had broken and emptied its contents, quicksilver, mercury to you and me, into the bottom of the beaker. The glass plate had been exposed to mercury vapour. And that was the secret. Louis Daguerre developed his idea and called his pictures daguerreotypes. He sold millions of them all over the world. And what did he do with the cash he earned? Well, he went to the seaside and put his feet up. Now, here's another colour trick for you. What colour's this? Black and white? Take a look at this. When I spin the disc, the white bits in the middle seem to change colour. One way they get a sort of yellowish tinge, the other way it looks a bit blue. So why does that happen? Well, it's all to do with the way we see colours. Our eyes can only see three colours, red, green and blue. And we make all the other colours there are out of just those three. White is a mixture of all three together. Now, the other thing is that our brain sees those colours at different speeds. It takes slightly longer to see the blue than it does the red and the green. Now, when I spin this disc, because of the way the white is laid out on the pattern, our eyes and our brains just get confused. Spinning it one way, we only have time to notice the red and the green part of the white. Now, red and green makes yellow, so it gives it a yellowish tinge. 
And the other way, it sort of works in reverse. And we only notice the blue, so it gives it a bluish colour. Now, not everyone can see this. About 50% of people can spot the difference. Can you see it? Well, if you can, then it should be really clear. On November the 5th, we let off millions and millions of fireworks. Some go whistle, some go whiz, and some go bang. But all of them have beautiful colours. Where does the colour come from? It's all to do with salts. Now, you don't just use everyday table salt to make fireworks. They're special salts, like strontium salt, barium, copper, and calcium salt. Some of them are quite common things. I mean, copper's the same stuff you get in copper wire and the calcium is just like chalk. But some of them are quite rare. Now, amazingly, it's these plain powders that produce all those lovely colours that we see in November. The uh, strontium gives you red, barium gives you green, the copper gives you blue and the calcium gives you a yellowy-orange colour. But you can't just use these powders on their own. You need to mix them with up to three other powders. And then it's that final mixture that will really burn. And that's what's put in the fireworks. And to put it to the test, we're going to put it to the flame. Burning the powders in a dish like this shows the different colours. But these aren't fireworks. To get a big bang, you need to package the powders. All these fireworks use the same kind of mixtures that we've just seen. What they do is they carefully pack the right amount of powder into a cardboard tube like this. Now, for those really big bangers, you don't need special mega explosives or anything. It's all to do with how you pack it. It's tightly packed in the powder inside the packaging. Then as it burns, it gives off gas. The gas builds up until the whole of the packaging explodes like a balloon bursting. Now, keep watching till the end of the programme because we're going to go out with a seriously big bang. We've got our very own fireworks display for you. Wonderful, Kate. There were definitely some big bangs there, all right. That's it for the big bang for today. I've still got to do my trick. Oh, yeah, your carbon dioxide red and blue ink trick. That's right. The thing is, it's a trick. Yes, I know. That's why we're doing it now. No, no, it really is a trick. It's nothing to do with the colours. The reason that dioxide looks the same when the uh, carbon looks like a mirror image is not the fact it's red. It's the letters in the word dioxide. They look the same in a mirror image. You clever trickster. That really is it for the Big Bang right now. Next week, it's the last Big Bang in this series. We'll be looking at space, we'll be stargazing and revealing some of the secrets of the universe. See you next week. Bye-bye.